architecture is a team sport. We're not building monuments to ourselves. And the true success of our projects lies in understanding what success means to our clients and shaping our solutions, whether they're architectural or bigger, to address those drivers of success. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture. I'm your host, Ryan Willard, and today I have the absolute pleasure of speaking with Mansour Kazaruni. As the Global Director of Arcadis's esteemed Architecture and Urbanism Division, the company's recent accolade of being ranked second in the renowned World Architecture 100 bears testament to an unwavering commitment of Mansour's to excellence. With a career spanning over three decades across North America, Europe, India, and the UAE, Mansour has devoted himself to crafting environments that enhance the quality of life for individuals, whether they reside, work, commute, or seek leisure. At the helm of one of the globe's most vibrant and varied architectural firms, Mansour's dedication to design brilliance is mirrored in the team of multifaceted professionals at Arcadis. Positioned uniquely, they stand ready to confront the pressing challenges of the era. The expansion of architectural and urbanism proficiency empowers Arcadis to spearhead novel design paradigms, sustainable solutions, and digital leadership, all with a heightened emphasis on grandeur and scale. In this episode, we will be discussing how to avoid losing and siloing institutional knowledge in a large practice. We look at maintaining company culture as a business grows through acquisition of other organizations. And we look at how expertise and knowledge can grow and evolve in a large firm and also provide ever more value and services for the intricate needs of a client. So sit back, relax, and enjoy Mansour Kazaruni. And now a word from today's sponsor. A while ago, I began to hear reports of a company that was helping some of our clients build remote teams. We looked into it more closely and discovered the company World Teams that was helping small architectural practitioners build remote teams that were both capable and qualified. I was intrigued by another business that was addressing one of the critical pain points for small architectural practices, which is the ability to grow and shrink a team effectively, to be able to handle higher workflow without having to staff up significantly and also being very sensitive about labor costs. World Teams is built to address these issues. World Teams is a small but mighty company that helps architectural practices build high performing remote teams quickly and efficiently saving you the headache of sorting resumes and interviewing underqualified candidates. World Teams operates in your time zone and prioritizes near native English speakers, ensuring clear and efficient communication with your remote team members. They have flexible contracts so you can adjust your team size as your needs evolve. Additionally, you're connected directly with your skilled professionals, which fosters trust and collaboration. And World Teams helps you reduce your operating costs without compromising the quality that is so important to a practice. To download a free guide for building a remote team for a small architectural practice, go to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash world teams. That's one word, businessofarchitecture.com forward slash world teams. As a reminder, sponsorship is not an endorsement and you must do your own due diligence before entering into any business relationship. Go to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash world teams. Mansour. Welcome to the Business of Architecture. How are you? Great, Ryan. It's great to be here and uh, looking forward to our conversation. Excellent. So you are the Global Director of Architecture and Urbanism uh, Division at Arcadis. Uh, you've had a very impressive career. You've been the Global Director of Buildings at the IBI Group um, and right. have been a, a Director Executive Vice President there for over a, a decade. Um, you've been a partner at other practices as well, Page and Still Architects. Um, so a, a, a career with a lot of high level strategic positions um, at, at, at kind of really prominent uh, game changing practices, some of the sort of most influential practices on the, on the planet. So very, very exciting to be speaking with you and perhaps I could, my first question would be how would you describe what your current role is right uh so uh first and foremost at the core of it i'm an architect and um uh, i came to arcadis through 
uh, the recent acquisition of IBI Group, where, as you rightly pointed out, I led uh, the buildings practice there, the buildings uh, sector, as it was referred to there, uh, which was, frankly, 55% of the firm, very large practice of uh, about 1,500 people uh, um, across the globe and a very sort of diverse and exciting business. Uh, Arcadis acquired IBI in 2022, and uh, Arcadis, within its core, uh, had a large contingent of architects, urbanists, placemakers, um, who equally a uh, strong team and did a fantastic work. And the logical thing was to integrate both teams and create a singular, unified uh architecture and urbanism entity division within Arcadis so that uh, we could bring consistency in terms of our thinking, our design work, and our uh, service that we provide to clients uh, globally. Um, and I was tasked with leading that, uh, that enterprise. And that's what I'm doing currently. Uh, obviously, it's been a, a journey of integration and uh, every day we uh, we bring the team closer and closer together as one mm -hmm. unified team. And uh, I believe we are much, much uh, stronger by virtue of that. It's an interesting proposal to, you know, to merge with another firm or to be acquired by another architectural firm. Sometimes people can be very suspicious of that kind of activity or it, or it appears to be kind of aggressive and very corporate but you know we've had a lot of um, businesses in the past on business of our, on the podcast here who have gone through that process and it's a really fascinating way of kind of collaborating and joining forces and building new teams and sharing uh, and, and skills can you talk us through a little bit about perhaps some of your apprehension before the acquisition and you know how did it how did it emerge how did it happen look I'd, I'd have to go back a little bit in time for that you know uh, the best way to explain it you refer to you know early parts of my career and the start of my journey at uh, certainly my journey in Canada I grew up in India and I've worked in the United States I've worked in the Middle East and uh, really arrived in Canada uh, late 90s. And I started work at a firm called Page & Steel. Uh, very well-established, Toronto-based, 120-person practice, founded in 1926, and uh, did one thing, residential and mixed-use buildings in the city of Toronto. That's it. Very sort of focused, singular practice. And uh, fast forward, to uh, 2008, this firm called IBI comes along to acquire us. I ended up being a partner at Page and Steel in yeah. the mid 2000s, and and so this firm called IBI comes along to acquire us. And uh, and uh, frankly, as the youngest partner at Page and Steel, I wasn't thrilled about it because you know we were sort of diluting our sort of thoroughbred nature, if you like, and our singular focus. And I, mm -hmm. at the time, and naively, I thought that was not great. Uh, and, but coming to IBI was a real eye opener because IBI brought a very holistic approach to problem solving. IBI was, a, was organized in three sectors, intelligence, buildings, and infrastructure. That's what the IBMEI stood for. And and what I quickly realized is we were coming at uh, architectural challenges from the view of city building, very holistically getting involved in projects much earlier at the planning stages, getting involved in, you know, civil work, in entitlements, in transportation infrastructure and management and planning much, much before the architecture. Mm -hmm. And that gave us a really, it really broadened our view and our vision as architects. And I started to see the value in this multidisciplinary practice. And then you fast forward to Arcadis and that synergy gets further sort of amplified here where 
It's truly a global firm, 36,000 people. The diversity is just magnified in terms mm. of the service offerings at Arcadis, which is organized in global business areas of resilience, which deals with environment in at the largest scale that you can think of, uh, mobility, places, and in terms of the and intelligence, and in terms of the service offerings, it expands far beyond uh, what uh, uh, what IBI offered, and so I've seen this trajectory as expanding our ability as architects to really have meaningful impact in uh, all parts of the planet and at, a, at an unprecedented scale that we would not have been able to do as just a standalone architecture firm practicing one building type in one region. Mm -hmm. And to me, that's been the most exciting part of this journey. And, you know, as an architect, Ryan, in Toronto, having designed, uh, you know, my core practice in Toronto has been uh, high-rise residential mixed-use towers up to 9,900 stories. Uh, very exciting. Uh, but the ability to have this level of impact at scale mm -hmm. is far greater than a single building. And, and, and I, I love that. I think it's so exciting. That's really that's very inspiring, actually, to to hear to hear that, and it being a way of unlocking kind of more potential, and kind of being able and actually working when you're kind of collaborating and or or merging businesses, that actually it's opening up a whole load of of opportunity and ability to get architectural skill sets further upstream, if you like. And into different places that can have a, a, a deeper impact on the built environment, and, and then doing that as a, a kind of, a, you know, a, a business acquisition—that's really fascinating. And, and frankly, also thinking about how it enables us to add greater value to our mm. clients and the challenges that they're confronting, and and bring global thinking, best practices from around the world, uh, you know, cross-pollinate in terms of uh, the diversity that exists within the firm, uh, ideas, and I can share examples of what I mean by that. So it, it's a very, very different approach to architecture that mm -hmm. uh, I think is particularly exciting. Uh, yeah, I would love to hear some examples of, of that. That would be very interesting. Yeah, uh, you know, uh, let's start with uh, sort of within a and U, uh, as we refer to it, architecture and urbanism within mm -hmm. Arcadis. So architecture and urbanism within Arcadis, it, we've organized it in uh, sort of 10 different practice groups, which are all the building types that we practice in predominantly. Uh, and it starts with placemaking, uh, which is a big part of our practice, which includes planning, urban design, landscape, all of that. Living, which uh, broadly is what I described earlier as the patent steel practice. Uh, retail and retail-led mixed use. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, specialty retail uh, and then, you know, large mixed use developments, which have significant retail as an anchor. Uh, you know, some great retail work. Uh, I mean, uh, in New York, you know, we've we've been involved in the in the five story Tiffany flagship store. Tons of work for LVMH and others. We uh, opened oh, Saks nice. Fifth Avenue. I, I was in there recently. In LA. <laughs> right. So, you know, some great retail projects, some great retail led mixed use work. Uh, you know, we're we're involved with the point in. Salt Lake City right now, which is a very large uh, mixed use uh, sort of mm -hmm. retail led development. Again, uh, healthcare, you know, where uh, we we are involved in all levels of healthcare in the UK, in Canada, in the United States, in other parts of the world. Education, both elementary and higher education, uh, mm -hmm. sort of future of workplace, you know, where we are involved in workplace design. 
uh, both as building typology, but also sort of interior workplace design, industrial facilities, and uh, which we've recently rebranded as industrial and mission critical, mm-hmm. uh, because you know traditionally our industrial buildings practice had a lot of focus on the automotive and manufacturing sector. But we have uh, uh, really developed and advanced our capabilities with uh, data centers and gigafactories, uh, et cetera, uh, and which are, as you know, uh, quite uh, rapidly rolling out as we advance with technology and our, our increasing dependence on technology. Mm-hmm. Uh, we do a ton of government and civic work, and then we do uh, transit architecture. Mm-hmm. So uh, just to hone in on sort of two of these practice areas, healthcare and education, you know, and the ability, frankly, to uh, borrow concepts and and design tools from healthcare, uh, you know, like emotional mapping, which we've kind of uh, done digitally uh, and look at how that helps us to design better education spaces, you know, Mm -hmm. that support welfare and well-being of children in learning spaces, you know, using that kind of evidence-based research in one area, healthcare, to then translate that into our education practice, you know, therapies like snoozelin or understanding neurodiversity, the stuff that our healthcare team, but that cross-pollination, which just broadens our approach, allows us to bring a different perspective than a single focused education practice alone, yeah. but simply not have that access or that mindset. Uh, that, you know, is uh, is a very exciting approach to how we come at design by virtue of that diversity and that multidisciplinary nature. Well, how, how do you, as a practice, then? Because one of the one of the pitfalls I could imagine, certainly when you get when you're starting to get to a um, a certain size, and also through the process of acquisition of other of other businesses that perhaps might have had more specialisms, how do you prevent knowledge becoming siloed? or just kind of pooling up in one corner of, the, of, a, of a large office? How, how do you ensure that, that, that there is that cross-pollination of expertise and that people don't get um, kind of stuck into designing airport infrastructure for 25 years? But then I, I'd imagine as well, there's also a massive benefit in having people who are just specialized in doing airport infrastructure. And there's probably a, a whole group of people who adore it and love it and don't want to do anything else. Yeah, but you know what? I think I think it's about communication. Mm-hmm. It's about an openness. Uh, I recall a few years ago actually uh, suggesting within our leadership team that we should mandate that people from a certain percentage, like whatever, say 10% of people from every practice group should migrate to a different practice group in the next year and learn a whole new new building type and mm-hmm. all the drivers for its success and understand because you know we're we're we've moved to a world where single use single type environments are not as robust or successful or attractive as mixed use and hybrid sort mm-hmm. of communities and environments are and i firmly believe that in order to do that successfully you have to understand its component parts and all of the pieces that make it up so that you truly derive those design synergies. You truly sort of understand how to co-mingle. And it starts with co-mingling of the teams and the people and the professionals and the knowledge that Mm -hmm. they they bring to those, uh, those exercises. And there's a role that technology has to play in that as well, which we can talk about, but, but I feel like uh, uh, that, opportunity creation for the talent within our team to communicate on a day-to-day basis, but then to follow their sort of interests, uh, which we tend to facilitate every single time that happens. 
Mm-hmm. You know, uh, I'm reminded of an individual that worked in our transit team who uh, who really, uh, you know, wanted to actually approach me and said, uh, hey, I've been working underground for a long time. I really want to work uh, on above ground. You know, I want to see the light, so to speak. So so we brought him into the the high rise team and he started to see the way we work. And said, hey, you know, the stuff that you guys labor on, we figured out different ways to solve similar problems in our transit work and and uh, using technology. And here's how we do it. Mm-hmm. And he introduced us to, frankly, computational design and parametrics and all of that. And we were just fascinated on the residential team and thought, wow, this is great because we just opened up a world of possibilities Mm -hmm. and then you know pretty soon what became evident as you know the secret of the transit team of computational design got socialized was that there were applications for this throughout the firm Mm -hmm. and so it got this wide adoption and this individual now sits as part of our computational design leadership team and is agnostic to any practice. And what he does is applicable equally to each of those 10 practice groups I just described. So that cross-pollination, every time it happens, is just magic, Ryan. Yeah, that's that's amazing, and and you can you know that initiative or having an initiative like that where you're kind of you know you are ensuring that there is movement between becomes really important because you're kind of just releasing that potential into the office, that kind of institutional knowledge. So let me tell you, Arcadis is being very intentional about it. Mm -hmm. Uh, Recently, we've made a decision to migrate towards being a skills-powered organization. So really, it's not about your subject matter, knowledge, and expertise. Mm -hmm. It's about your core skills. And if we can agglomerate those skills globally and use the technology within our systems to have that embedded in our database, uh, we can bring the requisite skills to the table on any to solve or address any problem anywhere on the globe, uh, drawing from that global pool based on their skill sets, not, you know, the silo they sit in. Yeah. And I think that is just huge. It just unlocks the global potential of the firm. What sorts of skill sets are you um, kind of identifying that are, say, like like you mentioned, like they're, they're more agnostic skill sets as opposed to skill sets which are to do with specific experience inside of the, uh, the, the kind of typology niche? Well, look, it can, it can be internal facing, external Mm -hmm. facing it can be about uh you know leadership it can be about business acumen it can be about business development and uh it can be uh about uh, engagement and facilitation you know across communities uh it can be uh technology as i just talked about and its application across practice groups, uh, and frankly, outside of architecture and urbanism, you know, uh, so, uh, you know, people skills, there, there are so many facets to it, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and uh, yeah, so I think it's just a very, very different approach to how we create our teams, which, which doesn't suggest that, uh, Unless you went to architecture school, uh, you can't add value to it. I mean, look, we have an experienced design team that's part of uh, A&U, you know. And and so when we start uh, on these projects very early uh, in the design process, we're more focused on what's the intended experience here, mm-hmm. right? We're not even drawing lines on paper. We are curating an experience so to speak. Mm-hmm. And and that could be applicable in so many uh, things outside of architecture, in my opinion. 
you know, we have a sustainability sort of uh, team across Arcade as a global sustainability team. And uh, it has equal application in, in sort of the water and resilience practice of Arcadis as it does in the buildings and architecture practice of Arcadis. So, so it's, it's creating those kinds of skill sets as well that have global application and are not mm-hmm. limited to a particular practice group that we think will be hugely with, beneficial. With, with those kinds of um, overarching groups uh, where there's a kind of body of knowledge and they're kind of, you know, I can, I kind of, the way I'm imagining it is that you've got, you do have kind of specific practice types at Arcadis and then you've got these overarching groups that make sure that, you know, knowledge is being spread across them. Do the people in the groups, say in the sustainability groups, are they still part, like still practice, you know, kind of part of um, groups and projects individually? And then that's yes, another. Yes, very much. Yeah, yeah. Very much. Yeah, very much. They're not just. I mean, you know, uh, they are parts of groups and projects, uh, but but they're not siloed. They're not limited to. Right. Hey, you're just the, you know. Uh, the architecture team or the resilience or the mobility team and you know they cross pollinate right we have within uh, arcadis places we have program managers and project managers and cost consultants they could equally work across uh business areas right Mm -hmm. and so uh yeah that that cross pollination is really important so let's take it to the next level uh and that next level is The Arcadis approach is about solutions. So, uh, you know, we're not, we're not just focused on providing a service or a menu of services. We're more interested in creating solutions that address our clients challenges, Mm -hmm. right. And global challenges that we are, we are confronting. And so in order to get to a solution you oftentimes need a suite of services a suite of capabilities uh, that may not come out of one division or one business area Mm -hmm. so that whole model of global collaboration is fostered through the approach of solutions what all do we need to know and do to solve this issue or this problem and it, that's a very, very different approach again. It, it's, I, I love this because it's, this is kind of very, in many ways, it's more architectural. Um, just kind of focusing on being able to provide solutions. I, when, I, when I hear practices, and particularly larger practices, I kind of have the ability to be able to do this because they've got of the, of the resource and of the things that you've been illustrating. You've got, you know, knowledge starts to compound itself in terms of its utility and application and insights from one project typology. If there's a, a means of communicating it across can be very kind of pertinent and, and profound. When we're looking at, you know, providing solutions, the, um, the interesting question comes up, well, how do you define problems or what, what, what sorts of diagnosis or problem definition do you do with your clients? Because that becomes quite interesting. I could imagine that, you know, your ability to be able to define a problem is a great way of being able to meet clients further upstream before they even know that they need some architecture, for example. Because you're in a conversation about um, logistical problems or problems with their with the organisa- with their operational efficiencies, or they've got problems with you know kind of a, a brand experience, which might seem a little bit outside of the of the traditional architectural things, but actually they're they're brilliant things to apply the architectural um, lens of thinking upon. Well. It... You know, you've already touched on two or three in in just your question on two or three uh, issues where we come at it much, much uh, at a much, much higher level than we do with an architectural sort of offering. Right. You've talked Mm -hmm. about brand. You've talked about uh, sort of real estate portfolio optimization, uh, you know, and and 
so let's take real estate portfolio optimization, you know, and in that instance, you know, you'll get a client who basically, uh, you know, says I've, I've got this and, you know, honestly, it's, it's not working. It's, it's very sort of fragmented. It's disparate. It's broken. Uh, we need to, you know, we need a solution. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, we, we have the ability to, to run analysis, to do feasibility studies, to look at, uh, to do like a, uh, you know, even at, at the numbers stage, uh, you know, a cost sort of benefit analysis, uh, do spatial analysis, do stakeholder engagement, talk to people, uh, find out which parts of that, that experience with those spaces is working, which is not working. What are the cha locational challenges? Uh, what are the technology challenges? And then uh, gain a holistic understanding of that entire portfolio mm. and then curate a solution that says, hey, listen, you know, we think there's, you know, some divestment required, some design required, some new build required, some regeneration or retrofit. And, and then kind of say, okay, which parts of the firm have the capability to do these right. things? You know, there's some, you know, you can, you can agglomerate, you've got, you know, eight different locations, but you have this one location where you have the ability to consolidate and you can let go and you can agglomerate and then, you know, do we do a master plan? So, you know, I don't know in every situation, it's a different solution, but the ability to start there, yeah. right? To start much earlier. Uh, and, and, you know, so, so I think that that's exactly what I'm talking about. I, I, I find that so Until interesting and, and it is, it's so valuable of that kind of insight that architects can bring to their clients, you know, just applying the architectural way of looking at those broader strategic things that, that a client might be dealing with and then helping a client, you know, go through the whole process that might end up in some, you know, a building or the, the changing of a physical asset. How, how do you get clients to be comfortable with you to bring you problems that might be outside of what, they might think a traditional architect does is it is it pr primarily like repeat or you know, clients that you've already got a relationship with so they understand you or can you do this with people who have never worked with you well i think we can do both but i think it's essentially thinking of us as your trusted partner not as mm -hmm. your sort of consultant who you call because you need to renovate your office space or you need a new office building i you know i often get calls from clients who who basically say hey i'm i'm looking at a site you know i haven't i haven't put an offer in on it yet but what's your opinion and can you evaluate it for me or things like that and we willingly do that because you know first and foremost we want to ensure that our clients are set up for success uh i'll tell you uh, ryan uh within arcadis we've got a very uh very strong key client program, right? And, and these key clients really treat us as their trusted partner. They take us with them across the world and they know to engage us as early as possible in exactly that, in understanding their challenge in every new sort of uh area venture that they are foraying into and then recommend solutions and then see which part of Arcadis can support them in sort of envisioning those solutions and, mm -hmm. and uh, creating whatever outcome is required. So that key client program, uh, it actually... Um, it's a very small group of clients who, who uh, contribute to a very 
uh, sort of a vast majority of our business, over 50% of our business, uh, actually comes from that key client program. And, and that relationship is something we value very much because, uh, and I think they value as well, because otherwise, why wouldn't they seek out a page and steal, you know, single use, sing go to every city and find an architect who can renovate your office space or build you a residential building mm -hmm. because, you know, you'll find that in every city in the world, right? Yeah. But you won't often find a global partner who has global solutions, who has many, many sort of uh, core capabilities embedded within the business that and locations, 30 countries around the world that can travel with you, that understands the local context by virtue of its presence there, that understands what it's going, you know, a solution in in Canada versus the United States versus the UK versus Italy, France, Germany, India, very different, right? The cultural context in which you're operating. And, and the ability to do that and at the core of it know who is the client? That, yeah. that is universal, right? That's singular. You understand that client's DNA, no matter where in the world you are. That key client, that kind of special relationship, uh, you know, it, it's a firm like ours that can provide that. And we've recognized that, our clients recognize that, our key client program is very much based on that sort of relationship. That's wonderful. Uh, it's re really, really innovative and a very nice way of just kind of just talking about long term client relationships um, and the, the kind of maturing that businesses can go through to, together um, and kind of be entering into new, new territories. Are there certain types of organizations and businesses that Arcadis is looking for to to work with and other ones that they'll steer steer clear of and how do you you know what what are your what are your criteria for for um engaging in these kinds of quite intimate relationships with with you know over over a long term period how do you how do you vet clients and make sure that they're an appropriate look, fit for you uh, look the arcadis mission overarchingly is quite simple right improving the quality of life mm -hmm. right and and so the first the first level at which we're looking for alignment is uh clients that are truly sort of committed and interested in that right improving the quality of life in the communities that we serve at whatever level uh i don't know if you know the history and the genesis of Ar arcadis which you know is a dutch firm uh, founded in the Netherlands in 1888, and uh, oh, wow. you know the early preoccupation. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and the early preoccupation was uh, was human endurance and keeping uh, keeping sort of most of the Netherlands uh, above water and turning unusable land into usable land, right? And in doing so, creating opportunities for a nation and improving their quality of life. You right. know, and, and so so that that's the foundation upon which this firm is is kind of built. And and so obviously we're looking for alignment in mission, alignment in values uh, and uh, firms that can truly leverage our global capability. Uh, they don't necessarily need to be, uh, you know, purely international clients who travel the world with us. Uh, but alignment and values, you know, I was in Portland last week uh, visiting our team over there, and uh, I was very fortunate that uh, they had planned on me leaving early, uh, leaving the office early and had an, a tour organized of a project right after I left. Uh, my flight was delayed, so I decided to go on the tour with them. I was so lucky to get that. You know, we went and visited uh, River Grove Elementary School. It's a school that we're just completing, and I believe it'll open in the fall. Uh, and it's uh, all electric, nearing net zero, first elementary school in the United States to be on the microgrid. Wow. And that's such an alignment with our objectives of creating 
uh, sustainable sort of communities that, you know, uh, are are contributing to a planet positive future for future mm -hmm. generations. That's total alignment in values, right? That we, we cherish, we welcome, uh, and we love. And so that's a local client, you know, it's a local school district, you know, they're not going with us to the Netherlands, uh, but, you know, they're certainly helping us advance our mission. We're helping them advance their mission. So our, our attraction is to clients who we have those kinds of synergies with, who we can truly add value to what they do mm -hmm. and they can truly gain benefit from our global capabilities. Amazing. What sorts of challenges then, you know, with, with such a, a large um, global firm, what are the kinds of challenges that Arcadis is, is facing as a business, either in, internally or just with the kind of, um, you know, ever shifting economic environment that, that we're all living in or the, the kind of macro environment that we're kind of doing business in at the moment? Look, it's it's a very, very exciting time, frankly, at Arcadis. You know, we're navigating change. We have been for the last two years. There's been a massive integration underway uh, mm -hmm. because not only did Arcadis acquire IBI Group, which was, you know, close to 3,000 people, also acquired DPS, which was another large firm in, uh, in the sort of... Uh, uh, medical sort of pharma manufacturing space and uh and that's you know a few thousand people as well so a very large integration of uh recently acquired firms and merging systems merging uh platforms merging practices operating procedures um getting on you know the same uh operating platform, as I said earlier, and most importantly, getting cultures aligned, yes. right? And, and learning from each other and having a willingness and openness to adopt each other's best practices and not lose the essence of what it is that made these acquisitions attractive in the first place. Uh, those are some of the key issues that we are uh, very intentionally contending with to ensure that uh, that uh, you know we continue to be uh, not just as successful, but that the whole ends up greater than the sum of its parts. And and so, frankly, I don't know if you classify that as a challenge or an opportunity, mm -hmm. uh, but that's been a big part of the journey of the last two years. Um, when when the, the businesses are going through this kind of merging process, what kind of time frames are we talking about from initial courting, you know, the, the kind of the first date to the, the, the final, the marriage proposal and then actually the wedding itself? Well, yeah, well, listen, from the, you know, from the courting to, I'm going to say, go live for architecture and urbanism <laughs> was uh, probably a little over a year. Uh, and, so it's quite fast. but then, you know, it was quite fast actually, but then, you know, that doesn't mean all the back end is resolved, right? Right. There's, there's more granular levels of integration that continue to happen, mm -hmm. you know, uh, whether it's, uh, you, you know, there's granularity, right? There's so many organizational sort of alignments that need to occur that continue to occur over a period of time. That could be another year, it could be a couple of years, uh, but, uh, but you know, you get to, uh, I'm gonna call it minimum viable organization. You know, you've got, the, you've got the structure in place to continue to do the great work that you're doing because at the core of it, you can't make integration and acquisition uh, you know, the preoccupation of the vast majority of the people. We've got to support our teams. We've got to support our clients. We've got to continue to do great work, great projects. That's got to be the preoccupation. And and so getting there as quickly as possible is the imperative. Amazing. And, and so that kind of, uh, yeah, we try to compress that. Um, I have some questions here, actually, which have, 
uh, come from some of our listeners uh, on the on the podcast who uh, uh, who are keen to, to for me to to ask ask yourself and other practice owners of uh, or uh, practice leaders of of large of large firms. Um, one question that, that's come up quite a few times is is how do you and it's kind of relevant to hear what we're talking about in terms of maintaining culture. Um, how does Arcadis maintain a culture of collaborative exploration within an office? Uh, where you've got a lot of people who may be wanting to be working remotely or not be in, in studios. Um, is that something that Arcade deals with or is everybody in the office all the time? Um, or how do, you, how do you maintain a culture when the office is, the, the whole notion of what the office is is constantly being challenged? Yeah, that's a very sort of pertinent and relevant kind of current uh, question. We contend with it every day. And, uh, you know, you've heard it all, right? You've heard about the, the water cooler conversations that are lost, the learning by osmosis, the, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, the mentorship, the, the ideas exchange. Look, at the core of it, we're a global firm, you know, and if we were to limit ourselves to collaborating in local offices only and fostering culture within a local office only, uh, then we are losing the vast majority of the, the culture and the collaborative opportunity of the global firm. Mm -hmm. So we have to figure out ways uh, to retain and build that culture uh, in virtual environments. We, we, you know, uh, in a firm like ours, you know, which is not, uh, you know, one office in one city, uh, and or five offices in five cities, we're talking about hundreds of offices in 30 countries, um, you know, how do you create a unified culture and a unified set of uh, values and approaches that uh, we have those conversations every day and we do have to rely on uh, virtual collaboration, online tools, particularly as we are committed uh, at a very, very high level to sustainability. We actually count our own carbon footprint and, and uh, set goals and standards internally right. for reducing them every year. So we, we are very prudent about our travel as well. Uh, so uh, very challenging, very challenging uh, to do that, but I, it really comes down to uh, ideas exchange, conversations, uh, giving people the time and space um, to step away from day-to-day -day projects to an mm -hmm. extent and, uh, and really gain from participating in these kind of global initiatives that are underway and really uh, understand what's uh, out there for them, right? And, uh, and then... Within local offices, I think it is important to an extent to have that level of interpersonal engagement, of a sense of being part of a team that's mm -hmm. in your immediate environment. But, you know, uh, Ryan, here's the thing that, that has struck me lately, that uh, we're... we're we've all been really preoccupied as architectural and other organizations about our teams, uh, which as we should be. But the other side of that equation is our clients mm -hmm. and the consultants and the colleagues that we regularly collaborate with on these projects. And when I think back to the pre-pandemic days to, you know, my own office here in Toronto, uh, if you came to the front lobby, it was kind of this hubbub of activity. You know, there were, you know, some of, you know, the most sort of active, busy, prolific developers in the city to be found in that lobby every day. Uh, they they bumped into each other. They They were excited. They added so much to the energy of the place. Mm -hmm. It inspired us. It inspired our teams. It inspired them. They were constantly exposed to, you know, they could walk up to somebody's desk and say hello. They'd run into a principal. 
So that, you know, that's the other part of the equation, right? Because yeah. we don't do architecture in a vacuum among ourselves. It's also our, our clients, our partners, the other stakeholders, consultants. And frankly, that's the piece that uh, I don't think we've dwelled on enough mm -hmm. about how, how that process has gotten diluted a little bit. Uh, so uh, I think there's a balance. There's an in-between ground here. For us as a global firm, it's, it's not a choice, right? We have to learn how to foster culture in a mm -hmm. virtual environment. Yeah, we have, uh, but we've also got to balance it with some in-person presence. Yeah, absolutely. Um, another question here that kind of um, sort of riffs off some of these themes is how do you encourage and train younger staff to be empathetic to a client's needs? Now, I don't know what the what some of the context was behind where that where that question comes from. Perhaps, and so you can take some liberty with how you might in, interpret it. But how how do you um, kind of foster a culture um, when with with younger architects becoming you know perhaps you know moving from where they might have been focused on design that interests them to now becoming sensitive and attentive to the needs of of a client is this something that just happens through osmosis or is there like a, a formalized training that happens or are you looking for the for particular sorts of people who have I, that I, yeah i think it's a mindset i think it's very much a, much a part of the culture of different firms mm -hmm. and uh and everyone approaches it differently but here's what i say to my teams architecture is a team sport uh we're not building monuments to ourselves mm -hmm. and the true success of our projects lies in understanding what success means to our clients and shaping our solutions, whether they're architectural or bigger, to address those sort of drivers of success. Mm -hmm. And if we ignore them, then we may end up with a pretty looking building that either doesn't function or doesn't uh, uh, serve its purpose or uh, doesn't make financial sense. And in all those three instances, it would be a failure or doesn't meet their sustainability objectives or doesn't mm -hmm. do the things that they wanted it to do with technology or whatever their driver of success is, right? So mm -hmm. I think at the outset, and that's where the listening becomes really important. We've got to be active listeners, you know, and participants. And, and so uh, that's certainly how we approach it. Mm -hmm. um, and and that, that and that's that's the guidance that we we give all our our junior team members. Love it, brilliant! I think that's the perfect place for us to conclude uh, the conversation there, Mansoor. That's been really, really fascinating and uh, a wonderful peek, um, you know, in the in the in the mechanical room, if you like, of um, what happens in Arcadus. <laughs> So I really appreciate your, your time and your sharing expertise there. It's my pleasure. And I, I just want to say thank you for, for giving me this opportunity to connect with you. I've enjoyed it. Excellent. And that's a wrap. And one more thing. If you haven't already, please do head on over to iTunes or Spotify and leave us a review. We'd love to read your name out here on the show and we'd love to get your feedback. And we'd love to hear what it is that you'd like to see more of and what you love about the show. And now a word from today's sponsor. A while ago, I began to hear reports of a company that was helping some of our clients build remote teams. We looked into it more closely and discovered the company World Teams that was helping small architectural practitioners build remote teams that were both capable and qualified. I was intrigued by another business that's addressing one of the critical pain points for small architectural practices, which is the ability to grow and shrink a team effectively, to be able to handle higher workflow without having to staff up significantly and also being very sensitive about labor costs. World Teams is built to address these issues. World Teams is a small but mighty company that helps architectural practices build high-performing remote teams quickly and efficiently saving you the headache of sorting resumes and interviewing underqualified candidates. 
World Teams operates in your time zone and prioritizes near native English speakers, ensuring clear and efficient communication with your remote team members. They have flexible contracts so you can adjust your team size as your needs evolve. Additionally, you're connected directly with your skilled professionals, which fosters trust and collaboration. And World Teams helps you reduce your operating costs without compromising the quality that is so important to a practice. To download a free guide for building a remote team for a small architectural practice, go to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash world teams. That's one word, businessofarchitecture.com forward slash world teams. As a reminder, sponsorship is not an endorsement and you must do your own due diligence before entering into any business relationship. Go to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash world teams. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.